And now it is my pleasure to introduce our uh, next presenters. Uh, we are really excited to be hearing um, about emotional wellness. The title of the presentation is Ancestral Wisdom and Cultural Practices for Emotional Wellness. Uh, this session is sponsored by the um, Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield of Utah, Utah Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health, Utah State University College of Humanities and Social Sciences, Utah State University Emma Eccles Jones College of Education and Human Services, and Utah State University Extension. Um, and it is being presented um, by the Paiute Indian Tribe of Utah. Just another reminder that this session is being recorded, okay. so um, if you would like to remain anonymous, please do turn off your video and change your screen name uh, during the recording. And now I would like to go ahead and introduce our featured guests for this uh, session, Roger Clark and Chris David. Uh, Roger Clark has worked for the Paiute Indian Tribe since uh, 2015 when he started as an intern in the behavioral health field. He is presently the prevention coordinator for the tribe and oversees the Native Youth Program, providing substance abuse and suicide prevention. Roger has facilitated substance abuse groups and prevention groups, as well as providing individual mental health and substance abuse counseling. Roger received his Bachelor of Science degree from Southern Utah University in Psychology and a Master's degree in Clinical Mental Health Counseling from Alamosa University in Colorado. He is a board certified counselor with the National Board of, um, sorry, board certified counselor and is a licensed ACMHC. Roger has Paiute ancestry and is a longtime resident of Cedar City where he grew up and finished high school. Roger and his wife Leslie have five children and six grandchildren. The Native Youth Program at the tribe um, is primarily funded through the Indian Health Services Substance Abuse Suicide Prevention Initiative. This program is based on the philosophy that culture is prevention. Thus, a focus on tribal and Native American culture is part of all Native youth activities. The tribe provides ongoing cultural activities, including Native American flute circle, open powwow and hand drum circles, sweat lodge ceremony, and red road to sobriety meetings. Annual cultural events of the tribe include the spirit run, um, the annual restoration gathering powwow, tribal veterans honor dinner, and honoring our Native American woman event. And then uh, Chris, David was born and raised in Lower Greasewood, Arizona. He is an enrolled member of the Navajo tribe. And I'm just gonna ask Chris to uh, name his clans because I know that uh, I will not be able to pronounce them correctly. Yeah, my first clan, can you guys hear me? Yeah? Yes. Okay, my first clan is a uh, is Dead Tkachkini. Second one is second one is uh, Tkabaha. Third one is uh, Kinfachini. The last one is Hanavati. So thank you so much. His parents are Anna David and Edward David. Chris graduated from Dixie State College with an Associates of Science degree, a bachelor's degree in sociology and criminal justice from Southern Utah University, and a master's degree in clinical mental health counseling from the University of Phoenix. His relationship with the community is enhanced by the philosophy of walk in beauty, to walk in harmony with all things. As a traditional counselor, Chris's approach is to incorporate Native American spirituality into psychological counseling with Native American clients. Chris has six children and one grandson. In his free time, he enjoys hiking and exploring the beautiful mountains of Southern Utah. Four Points Health, uh, the tribe's health department, operates five community health centers located throughout Southwest Utah that are open to everyone and provide quality medical, behavioral health, and dental services. As taught by our Paiute ancestors, we believe in treating the whole person, which includes the body, mind, emotions, and spirit. Uh, so thank you so much, Roger and Chris, for joining us. We are so excited to hear from you today. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna go ahead and uh, jump into our PowerPoint presentation here. Let me see if I can access this really quick. I have to take it off this camera and put it on the ca okay. computer camera. <clears throat> Yay, can you guys see that okay? It's great. Yes, you can. Okay, let me go back a couple of slides. 
little bit of technical difficulty here. Apologize for that. <laughs> so I'm gonna go ahead and take off my mask here so I can speak a little bit more clear. <clears throat> you guys can see me, right? Okay. All right. Thank you, Claire, for the kind introduction. Uh, I guess in Southern Paiute, we would say Mike. So yateh, Mike. Um, hello, my relatives. It's good to be here with you guys this morning. Um, our focus on this presentation is ancestral wisdom and cultural practices for emotional wellness. And I caught a last bit of that last presentation and uh, did a really good job. <clears throat> so basically, the information that I'm going to share is based on multiple disciplines, which include personal experience, traditions, ceremony, and higher education. I feel very fortunate to have grown up with these teachings. I spent a lot of time when I was younger with my, with my elders. My grandmother, Shema Sanan, as we say, as we would say in Navajo, she was a, she was a medicine woman. Uh, she was a hand trimmer. So the community spent, uh, would depend on her for a lot of healing practices. And my uncle, Shada, uh, was a road man for NAC. They encouraged growth, education, and cultural knowledge. I learned through ceremony, talking circles, story time with my elders, song and prayer. I'm a big supporter in recovery. I well, variety, A meetings, Red Road. The teachings emphasize connection, compassion, identity, and balance. The beautiful teachings I received from my elders are meant to be shared. So the stuff I wanna share with you guys today, I'm passing it on to you, and you guys are welcome to share with other people as well. What we have here is a, here's a medicine wheel. <clears throat> Many of you guys are familiar with it. It's also known as a wellness wheel. It dates back thousands of years, has four components, each having a symbolic representation. It has a purpose and a teaching. The symbolic rep representation varies from tribe to tribe. So I encourage you guys, each of you guys, to learn a representation within your tribal teachings. Seek the guidance from your elders. I encourage uh, you guys to understand the, the creation part of it as well. And we're also going to focus on the emotion part of this medicine wheel. <clears throat> as you can see, the components are all interrelated. They're connected. Emotional health influences spiritual health, which influences mental health and physical health. Over the years, these teachings helped me establish my core values and beliefs. At times, I challenge my thought process and decision making. I would ask myself, what am I, is, is what I'm doing aligned with my values? When I was younger, I see wear a, a, a medicine wheel necklace. In times that I felt discouraged or when I felt lost, I often pick up that necklace and take a look at it. And I say, where am I at in this medicine wheel? What can I do? What can I identify to, to, to improve things? <clears throat> So what are the components of indigenous culture that allowed our people to thrive in positive mental health? Our culture offers so many things, so many positive mental health coping skills. There's two components we'll be talking about. Number one, self-esteem identity, and number two, self-care. During this presentation, I encourage each of you guys to ask, you guys to ask yourself a few questions. Where do I come from? Who am I? How do I sustain a positive outlook? What are some of my challenges? <clears throat> so self-esteem, identity, then again, this is pertaining to ancestral wisdom, through ceremony. So first thing we talk about is the origin of your tribe. Creation stories can be interpreted through ceremony, song, and prayer. Every aspect of our culture has a beginning and a purpose. The animals, the plants, the sacred elements play an important part. When we learn of these things, we have a sense of identity. We know where we come from. This gives us a lot of courage. Second one here is kinship, clan systems, relatives, belonging, and connection. When we share our plants and speak our native language, it validates our ancestors. The universe recognizes it. 
we can personally trace, I can personally trace my clans back to my ancestors that were in the long walk. It reminds me I come from a strong lineage of warriors that survived many atrocities, which gave me a great deal of confidence. I tell myself, we are resilient. I want to share a quick story with you guys. Uh, a, few years, a few years back, I went to a training up in uh, Portland, Oregon. Um, and one of these trainings, one of the days we had presenters, we had a Native American group present. And during the presentation, they had a drum group that came out. And before they started, they shared their clans. And I immediately made a connection with them for they were from my area as well. So even though I was hundreds and hundreds of miles away, I made a connection with them. And after the presentation, I caught up with them, you know, and it really took me in. I kind of felt like at home and I felt safe. So that's the importance of clan system, <clears throat> feeling connected, sense of belonging. <clears throat> Next one I'd like to talk about is ceremonies. Vision quests, sweat lodge, sun dance, and this motivation, a movement, and meditation. Each of us have played an important role in ceremony when we participate. It allows us to be part of the healing process. Take, for example, the sweat lodge. We have a fire keeper, a singer, a drummer, a water pourer. Ceremony offers us stillness and quiet time, time to reflect and give thanks. Ceremony helps us practice gratitude, which allows us to recognize the good things in our life. Ceremony also provides us a safe haven for many. I often hear my relatives when I'm sitting in sweat lodge, it's good to be home. <clears throat> Every milestone is celebrated. Ceremony is very intimate time for family members. For example, when a rite of patches ceremony is taking place, the intimate time between the mothers and daughters is really important. Feather giving ceremony, warriorship, rite of passage, when, uh, also a naming ceremony. Those are very intimate times fathers spend with their sons. <clears throat> Another one is uh, social gatherings. And again, talk a little bit about family time. As seasons pass, it gives us an opportunity to help one another. For example, in the springtime, we gather planting and we harvest it in the summer. This is a great time for each of us to support one another to build intimate relationships, to support and to listen. Self-compassion, learning to be kind to ourselves. As two-legged beings, it's very hard for us to be self-compassionate. We're always really hard on ourselves. <clears throat> if we learn to forgive ourselves and be patient, we can grow and influence others in a good way and we can develop good relations with one another. Becoming aware of your emotional needs. Then again, it's also uh, a challenge to do that. Looking at yourself. Becoming aware of your emotional needs is an ongoing process. We're constantly evolving and growing. Reflecting our thoughts and practicing mindfulness on a regular basis is key. We do this through meditation and spiritual practice. The second one I'd like to talk about is self-care. Self-care comes in a lot of different ways, the shapes and sizes. Here are a few examples that pertain to Native American spirituality. <clears throat> Smudging, cleansing your sacred space. This is a practice that our ancestors did often. Many people use cedar, sweetgrass, sage, and many other herbs to cleanse the air. Tobacco ties is a common practice for prayer and offerings. When we harvest this medicine, we build it's a relationship with Mother Earth. We never take more than we need, and we always give back. Smudging time is a, is a time to meditate and ground yourself. <clears throat> then again, stress management. Practicing mindfulness, breathing, and grounding skills. Indigenous people have natural talents and creativity. We all know that. Playing the flute can regulate breathing, also doing some beadwork, singing, and running, to name a few. Many tribes encourage running in the morning as a spiritual practice. <clears throat> also, boundaries, relationships, sacred space. The importance of having relations, having healthy relations in your life is, is important. 
This is also recognizing your sacred space, protecting your mind, spirit, and body. Particularly during this time of COVID-19, it's important to maintain social distancing. Many of our elders have compromised immune systems, so boundaries is important, recognizing that. Asking help from, from a family or our elders. <clears throat> Finding someone that you can trust, sometimes that can be difficult too. Our elders are knowledge bearers and use storytelling for motivation. Many of our stories don't, don't promote shame. They often tell stories of healing and self-love. When I was younger, when I used to goof up, it's really interesting how my grandparents uh, used to approach this. Um, rather than lecturing me and putting me down, a lot of times they would tell me stories about the coyote or the buffalo, how they have strength and honor and encourage to overcome things. And what I got from those stories was like, you know what, I can be like the buffalo. So elders are keen in this when they story tell. <clears throat> okay, sleep. Uh, recovery and dream time. Tosh and Kelsey talk about this in their Welfare Culture podcast. I'm not too sure if you guys listened to the podcast before, but they have a wonderful uh, a model that covers seven different areas. And they talk about sleep and dream time. Um, rest and recovery time promote growth and also strengthen the immune system. It is also improves memory and muscle building. Dream time also helps us connect to our ancestors for guidance. A lot of times we do, do that through uh, ceremony as well. Food and water. Having a balanced diet is super important for emotional wellness. Our elders remind us that water is our first medicine. We spend about nine months in our mother's womb, which consists of water. We can develop a sacred relationship with food as our ancestors did. When our ancestors planted corn, it was used as food and medicine. Corn pollen in an apple way, for example, is considered sacred. These are special things there's something special about when we harvest, for example, corn. There's something special about it when we gather it up and we prepare it as a meal. You know, the taste that sits there, it's like, wow, this is really good. And when we know that, you know, we've planted this, you know, it's coming from our fields, it feels really good. <clears throat> Exercise, connection to Mother Earth, um, movement is medicine. Again, referencing well for culture, every aspect of our livelihood in involves physical movement, hunting, ceremony, planting, and migration, to name a few. All of these things that I mentioned reduce stress, reduce anxiety, depression, and anger. Your grounding skills. <clears throat> In the world of psychotherapy, Richard Schwartz is a founder of internal family systems, described parts as a whole. <clears throat> and when we take a look at the medicine wheel and we look at that as a whole, and we divide those things into parts, we can see that we can focus on these particular parts. The part of self is to heal ourself. Elders teachings of the medicine wheel. We are born with one of these virtues. I was told at a young age that um, uh, people are growing up with either spiritual components, emotional components, physical components, or mental components. More of some people more spiritually inclined, some people are more uh, physically inclined. So our job through our livelihood is to find a balance in all of that. And quite often when we have a medicine wheel, we take a look at it and see where, where am I in this medicine wheel? Do I need to gravitate towards more emotional well-being? Do I need to pay some attention there? The quote goes on to say, it is our goal, like I said, to find, to find that balance. Find balance in life, find a center, and feel strong, centered, and interconnected. All right, so I'll turn this time over to Roger. Thank you. All right, thank you, Chris. I'm not sure if you can see me or not, but that's okay if you don't. I'll take the mask off anyway, so you can hear me a little better. Anyway, um, Chris is one of our is our uh, traditional counselor here at the tribe, 
uh, he sure brings a lot to us to be able to bring the, the traditional things as um, Claire read in my uh, bio there I have uh, Paiute ancestry so I have an invested uh, part of this tribe and, and certainly enjoy the job here and doing the things that we're able to do anyway today our uh, as Chris talked about we're um, we're talking about the emotional part of the medicine wheel and that's the west portion of the medicine wheel. The west is one of the four directions and it has uh, water to sustain life, sage for smudging and purification, autumn for the season of life which brings about emotional health. So some of the components of emotion, many researchers involved in, be in the behavioral health field agree on three components of emotions. The physiological component, the cognitive component, and the behavioral expressive component. The physiological component makes up the physical body, the autonomic nervous system, muscle, tissue, bone, and organs, to name a few things. These are the, these are the things, the physical body and the things inside that take care of us, keep us supported, keep us walking around, keep us doing the things that we need to do helps keep us on task as we need to, but th this is a physical part of it. Another part is the cognitive. The cognitive component includes our thoughts, values, and expectations to help determine the type of and intensity of the emotion re emotional responses. These responses are very individual. One person may experience an, in an intensely pleasurable moment that may be dull and boring to another person. And it reminds me of a story about when that uh, movie came out, The Greatest Showman with uh, Hugh Jackman. And I always tell my sister, I says, you know, when I grow up, I want to be Hugh Jackman. So anyway, she teased me about that. But anyway, um, that movie, you go see the movie and it brings on a lot of emotions. If you have seen it, you maybe understand it a little bit. But one person can go to that movie and enjoy it, enjoy the song, enjoy the dance, enjoy every part of it. And you talk to somebody else about it and say, you know, it was just too many songs and it was just too boring. And so our emotions are very individual. They come from many contexts of life where we've been growing up, where our foundations were built, the things that we've gone through, the trauma that we've experienced, education that we've experienced, the relationships that we've had. Um, all, all those things come together to, to determine how we react to certain things and, and certain emotions that we go through. And the third is the uh, behavioral expressive. We talk about our emotions, but more often we express them uh, non-verbally with the behavioral expressive, facial expressions, gestures, body position, use of an eye glaze or tone of a voice. So I can imagine what it was like Monday morning when maybe Michelle and Claire walked into the office, which one of these emotions that they had on their face. Sometimes they're hard to, uh, to hide, but uh, they're with us a lot of times. They had other people pick up on these things and maybe give them an idea how to treat us during that day. And, uh, but that's all part of emotions also that we experience. And so you've heard just a little bit about the science of emotions and uh, we're going to be moving into um, how science affects the feelings and some of the feelings that we experience as we go through those. Here's fear. Fear is one of the strongest emotions. At this point in this man's life, the physiological component is accessing the autonomic nervous system. The heart rate increases, blood pressure raises, digestive system shuts down, we start to tremble as adrenaline and epinephrine pour into our system for strength to fight or to run. The cognitive component tells us that we are dead if we don't get away and survival is our only thought at this time. That house payment or the late car payment that's going on at the time, we don't care. We are in there to either fight or get away, but our survival is at the pinnacle right now. So, as you can imagine, the next response, a behavioral express, expressive component, could look something like this. Fear, a fear in the face. Full engagement of the sympathetic 
nervous system, which floods our system with hormones that give us superhuman strength to run or to fight. Or fly away. <laughs> well, as it turns out, these two actors were from a movie called The Bear that was out many years ago, and they're real good friends in real life. If something like this were to happen and the person had an extreme scare, the fight or flight system would take full control. Seconds later, the danger disappears. What happens to that high octane fuel that just was poured into our nervous system? Well, it can't stay there for long. If it does stay there for long, it could damage our heart, our lungs, our muscles. All those things could be at jeopardy at that point. So at this point, the parasympathetic nervous system takes control. This system slows the heart rate, reduces blood pressure, starts up the digestive system again, shuts off the adrenaline and epinephrine hormones and relaxes the muscles. Chris talked about balance earlier in this presentation, how balance is so important in our lives. And these two play together in balance. The sympathetic and parasympathetic systems have worked together to bring balance back into life. So as we have gone through and evolved in our lives, we go back into, if we were to turn the clock back in history a couple of thousand years, and we would see Native Americans in perfect harmony with Mother Earth and the things that have gone on there, the bodies have evolved to be able to take care of, um, you know, eat the plants and the things that are, are provided by the creator at that point. When something like this would happen, uh, face on with a cougar or a bear or something like that, then uh, we would have that ability to uh, fight or to run at superhuman strength. Now our bodies have evolved to that, were evolved to that perfect position, but these things are still present in our lives today, these, these uh, things that we have in our body for the sympathetic nervous system where, where it pours these hormones in for us to be able to you know, take care of ourselves to go into survival. So if we were to think about maybe the uh, top sales executive, he just closed a deal in Tokyo and this is the deal of his life and he has to travel to the Los Angeles airport, say, to get on a flight and close this deal in Tokyo. The whole company is depending on it and his life source is depending on it as well. And so as he's driving along and he gets about 20 minutes away from the airport, the traffic comes to a dead stop and he's not moving an inch. So what's going on with his system? Well, the same things as the fight or flight, things are going on. He knows what is on the line here and he knows that he's got to get to the airport, but he doesn't have any control on it. So the adrenaline, the epinephrine, the cortisol is pouring into his system and what does he do about it? There's nothing he can do about it. Now our bodies are made up so that we are able to use those things up, but if we just sit and go through these things, it's tough on the, on the, on the system to be able to do that. And so exercise is important to keep our emotions in place, uh, to work off some of these hormones and things that we are, are given that we can be able to survive. All right, so as we experience difficulties in life, some things can be quite de debilitating, such as a physical il illness. It's hard to find balance when we don't feel good. Another debilitating element is emotions. Emotions have a big influence on how we behave, how we think, how we feel. Again, if we don't feel good emotionally, it's hard to find balance. So when we have a physical illness, we probably need to take care of that physical illness before it's, it's time to move on to other things in life. It's one of the foundations that keep us going. When we have that nausea, that sick feeling, we have uh, maybe a little touch of food poisoning or something like that. Boy, it's, sometimes it's tough to get out of bed. Sometimes it's tough to be motivated and we need to get that taken care of and fixed. COVID-19, a lot of us that we've talked about have experienced or know people who, who have been through this know how that, that puts you down into bed and until we get through that it's tough to be motivated and move on but once those things start coming back into balance then we can start balancing our life with the physical as well as the emotional so here are some well-known and often experienced emotions that we go through first one 
as we talked about earlier, fear. Too much fear in life can be debilitating. Not enough fear can be dangerous and guide us to make poor choices and sometimes even cause death. Like the guy that's racing towards the railroad crossing saying, I'm pretty sure I can beat that train and doesn't quite make it. Or when we're out in the wilderness, you know, without enough fear, we might make ourselves go between mother bear and her cubs. Well, if that happens, somebody's probably gonna get killed. And without the fear and knowledge of that can keep us out of those places, uh, we could lose our life over those kinds of things. So fear is important, but it's also important to keep in control. Next one, anger. With too much anger, oftentimes unreasonable behavior is present. The anger has taken over our common sense. We might commit, commit an act that has irreversible consequences that negatively affect loved ones, family members, or close friends. Not enough anger may be a bearing on our own self-preservation. Balancing anger is very important, something that often takes concentrated cognitive effort. So as we go through these things and we uh, talk about some of these emotions, the cognitive effort that's involved there is, is really basically awareness. Awareness of where our points are, where our limits are. You know, we've heard oftentimes that we need to temper our anger and pull it back a little bit. As long as we're aware of how we operate, what our experiences from the past have brought into our lives, how we, how we react to certain things, we can be able to start uh, gaining control over these things so that we can bring that balance and harmony back into life. We get too much anger and things get out of, uh, get, can get very crazy. We get too much fear and we're afraid to go outside at all or do anything at all. And so to know those things about us, to become aware of those things about our own individual selves, very important so that we know how to operate and be able to bring our lives back into balance. So you remember this guy from a couple of movies ago, well, a few movies that we've seen. Um, the Hulk, he channeled his anger and helped save New York City. And I believe that because I saw that movie and I was impressed with it. Yeah, it was fun to watch anyway. All right, happiness. Who doesn't want to be happy? Everyone wants to be happy. Happy feels good. It feels especially good when you've just gone through a difficulty, such as the, when the house, when the roof falls in on the house because of those water leaks. And you wonder, how can this happen? Well, it was because I was too happy and I didn't pay attention to small difficulties until they got way too big. So we balance happy, happiness by paying attention to other important things in our lives. Sadness, certainly one of the most difficult emotions to experience. When sadness sets in, it often stays for a while, and sometimes only the passing of time can numb its effect on our lives. Sadness is, has such a strong, is such a strong emotion, it can take over our lives. But time goes on and doesn't wait for us. Eventually, we remember our loved ones need us. We have responsibilities. We have promises to complete. As we ponder through the sadness-promoting event, our minds can start making some sense of what things are going on. We can find our awareness. We can be aware of the things that we need, we need to do to be able to pull ourselves back into balance. We find spiritual strength, strength in relationship, careers that help move us through our lives. The creator has given us many, many gifts to pull us back into balance and harmony. And speaking of balance and harmony, Native America has understood its importance for thousands of years. Our beautiful Earth Mother is a prime example. Everything in Native America and Tu Veep, Earth, travels in harmony. The animals, insects, plants and rocks, oceans, streams and lakes all have purpose. Tavaputs, the sun, moon, Tuhuts, the moon, Putsiv, the stars, they all travel in har harmony with our Earth Mother and create yearly cycles of birth, growth and rest and the people follow cycles and keep harmony and balance with everything else okay so we need to make a little adjustment here to our uh, 
area and move this table out of the way and I've got to try to get back to a different camera. So I hope this works. I should have done it. All right, Claire, I might need a little help here. What do you see on your screen there? Uh, the other camera's going. Uh, let me just stop. If you stop your screen share, I think we'll see. Yeah, perfect. There it is. All right. Thank you. Let me uh, put that on this. Okay, so we had to move the set around just a little bit. All right, so this is a Native American flute. Um, as uh, Claire mentioned when we were talking about some of the things that we do here, um, part of the prevention department is that uh, we have a belief that culture is prevention. And so we do try to do a lot of cultural things with our kids. And one of them that a lot of kids have, uh, have taken on is the Native American flute. And when I talk to the, to the youth about the flute, I did talk to them about the harmony that the flute has to offer. That this flute was, was developed thousands of years ago, and it has uh, things about it that no other instrument in the world have. And one of those things being that every note can be played in harmony if you follow one simple rule. And it can bring about notes, it can bring about hate, uh, healing, the notes are, are expressed as, or um, also described as a haunting sound, and it's in a minor key. Well, that minor key grabs a hold of some of those things that are inside of your soul, inside of the, some of the difficulties that you are going through at the time, and expresses them out in, in the form of notes. And so it's able to relieve your body of some of the stress and some of the, of the negative emotions that you might be experiencing from the flu. And it sounds something like this. All right, so notes all together, all in harmony with one another, kind of like our spirits can be when we're in harmony with the physical and the, and the mental and the emotional are all together in harmony. But one of those things come out, out and it brings about something that could be a little bit annoying that sounds maybe something like this because I didn't follow the one simple rule. So you can see how annoying that can be if you don't follow that one thing. And it can be part of our awareness that we have once we are aware of how far that we go and how to start controlling these negative emotions so that we can bring our life back into balance. So Chris and I have got a little thing that we're gonna do for you here that has to do with balance and harmony. And um, These are two very different instruments, the, uh, the guitar and the flute. And just wondering what would happen if these guys, maybe a few thousand years ago, were to meet on the street somewhere, what, what things, what the conversation would sound like. The guitar would probably say something like, um, 
So what are you supposed to be? Well, I am a Native American flute. And what's so special about you? Well, Roger, guitar, I've been around for more than 60,000 years. I play a perfect harmony. I'm made of wood. And boy, do I sound good. <laughs> All right. But, you know, you're so skinny and funny looking. Look who's talking. You're fat, funny looking. What do you call yourself anyway? Well, I'm a guitar. <clears throat> well, what's so special about you? Well, I've been around for about 4,000 years. I can play any musical key. And not only that, I have been on the stage with some of the most famous players in the world. That's uh, how special I am. So, um, you know, you, you look so funny and stuff. Let, let's hear you play. Let's see what you're all about. I'd be delighted. <clears throat> No way! Yeah, I would have never thought that would have come out of you. Surprise! Yeah, I surprise! See, I want to hear what you sound like. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So, as an example, if we were to look at the flute as the, the physical components of, of uh, emotion, the physical part of the body, and then the guitar as the mental and the emotional, you could see this fight going on from time to time. When some battling back and forth, well, I don't feel good. Well, now I'm not feeling good either because I'm, I'm too upset or you know getting into depression or into stress and I don't want to talk to anybody and and so to bring balance and harmony back together these can sound really nice together so we're going to play a little thing here put them together <laughs> Yeah, I'll
demonstration, putting the physical or the physical back with the emotional and the mental and brings harmony back into life. All right, so we got to change the setup again, just a little bit. Okay, we can probably still use, leave it on that uh, that's, that camera. So now I'm going to share my screen one more time with you. Um, this is has to do with uh, the Paiute tribe itself, some of the things that we've been through and hit from history uh, to reinstatement to you know some of the clinics that we are able to have now, some of the things that the youth have, have done, and it will be accompanied by this song that we just played in its entirety. So, how come this isn't working? Oh, sure. there we go. Sure. Come on. All right, there we go. And you may need to adjust your volume on this as it starts to play. Roger, I think you need to switch the window that you're sharing on the screen. Oh, how do I do that? Uh, I think if you click screen share again, uh, you should be able to pick the one that's playing the video. Okay, sorry. Right here. Yes, yep. Can you share? Share. Right. Yep. Can you see it now, Claire? Yeah, that looks great. All right, let's start this again then. Here we go. Sorry about that.
Yeah. Not sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's our presentation, and thank you for inviting us to, to do this today. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, we've had so many comments coming through about how much people have been loving the presentation, especially the musical aspect. So thank you. Um, does anyone have, if anyone has a question, I think we have maybe one or two minutes we can take some questions before, uh, before coming back all together. So feel free to type questions into the chat box. See the flutes closer to the camera. Yes, we can. All right. Let's see, can we put it on uh, the computer camera? Yeah. That one right it. there? Yep. There you go. Okay. So this is my favorite. It's F sharp. Um, somebody wanted to see it. Was it, uh, anyway. Somebody wanted to see it a little closer up. There's one of them there. Uh, this one is an A, A minor. This one is an E minor. Um, the, the pitch is determined by how big around these are, uh, the length of the holes here and the length of the flute itself. So this is quite a low one. This was medium. Um, this one's a bit higher, that one there. Hey, Roger, if someone is interested in purchasing the flute, um, do you recommend any websites, any stores they can? Yeah, we, uh, we get our, our flutes are, are made for us by a place down in Patagonia, Arizona. It's called uh, High Spirits Flutes. And they do American or Native American style flutes there in many, many different options, and that'd be one place to go for it. But uh, high, highspiritsflutes.com. Okay, thank you. thank you guys. This is Lizzie. I just was looking through the chats and someone had asked if you make your own flutes. So that kind of answered that of where they could like <laughs> to get one. Another question came in saying, what was the name of the podcast that he recommended? It's Well for Culture. It's one word, Well for Culture. That's with uh, Tosh and Chelsea. And they do a really good job at interpreting um, the medicine wheel. And also they describe four, seven different areas of wellness. And um, I highly recommend following them. As a matter of fact, I, chat, I chatted with them before the uh, presentation today and I've asked them if I can use them as a reference. They said, yes, absolutely, of course. They have a wonderful podcast. They're also on um, Instagram. So go find them there. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. There's one other question coming in that says, could he explain about the harmony when playing the flute again? My sound cut out right then. I'm not sure if they're, um, what part they're talking about or when you were explaining okay. the harmony. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so so the, uh, the way that the, the Native American style flute is designed is it's designed that every, uh, every note will be in harmony with one another. They're, um, they're based on a, a minor key. And so being the minor key, if you have the negative emotions and things going on inside of you and you play through here, then it, then it pulls some of those emotions out. So it pulls some of the negativity out and expresses it out in, in notes. But uh, to make it, to give you an idea what it sounds like, it's like this. So that's just a simple scale, um, six notes, and all the notes being in harmony with one another if you follow that one simple rule, and uh, it'll, it'll stay in harmony, and then you can play, you know, from, from there. The unique thing about this is with all the notes being in harmony, if you follow the rule, then as you play it for meditation, you don't have to worry about the music because our kids don't play from music. They play from what's in their heart. And de depending on what's going on in their lives during that day determines on what the song sounds like is played here. 
So you don't have to follow any notes. You don't have to keep time or anything like that. It's all open. And so that's why the meditation works so good. And you don't have to think about those things. You play what's in your heart and it's expressed in the flute. And then those negative emotions are able to come out. Okay, thank you. We can see through the chat as well that Claire posted the links for both Well for Culture and High Spirits Flute, so you can go through the chat box. Um, a few more, one person just apologizing, asking, uh, sorry, what was the rule one more time? And another question following that, to play the right notes, or sorry, to play the notes eight after each other, um, is their question. Okay, so the rule's a secret. I can't tell you that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, so the rule is, all right, if you can see, see the fingerboard here, each one of those, you put your finger over each one of those holes. All right, so the rule is, is every note that you play, the holes below it have to be open. So if I want to play this note right here, these two holes have to be open. If I want to play this note right here, all these holes right here have to be open. My hand have to, has to be up. Because if you don't, then you get a sound like this. You see, that's that was played like that. So this this note was still being played along with this one, but these two were up, and that creates a funny sound, kind of an irritating sound. And so that's the one rule. And I didn't understand that second question. I'm sorry. Maybe you could tell me one more time. I think it actually was answered, just okay. playing the notes after each other. So. All right. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, well, it looks like we are a little bit out of time. So if you have other questions, so feel free to put them in the chat and we'll make a list of any questions that um, were not able to be answered maybe during the session and we can maybe follow up about questions afterwards if any more come in. So um, thank you so much, uh, Chris and Roger. We're so Happy to have been able to hear from you today. Uh, and if you guys want to take about a four to five minute break, we'll come all back together um, for our final wrap up sessions for this week. So thank you again for your wonderful presentation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.